So let's begin tonight's webinar. This is Chip Brogdon at the School of Christ.org, where tonight we continue with our series of teachings from the book of First Thessalonians. And we come to that chapter that we've been looking forward to throughout this study. It's First Thessalonians chapter 4, where we get to the real heart of what Paul wants to communicate to the Thessalonians, and that is the truth concerning the second coming of Christ. So uh, it's a good time to tune into the study. If you're new to the webinar, welcome. The way it works is I'll give a presentation. We'll go through the scriptures one by one here in First Thessalonians 4. And at the end of the presentation, I'll open it up for your questions and comments as time allows. Try to get things wrapped up around 930. It doesn't always work out to be that way. But we're glad to have you. And um, before we get started with the study, why don't we go to the Lord and um, ask him to bless our study in the word. And let's also pray for any prayer requests or needs that you have on your heart as well. So, Lord, we do thank you for the privilege of gathering together around the study of your word. I thank you that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there in the midst of them. So, Lord, we thank you that you are in the midst of us. We are joined together by not just the Internet, but joined together by your Spirit, baptized by one Spirit into one body. And so I thank you for the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the called out gathering of those who have been called out of darkness and into your marvelous light, called out of Babylon into the new Jerusalem. And, Lord, we bless you. And we pray, first and foremost, that Christ would be glorified and that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in this teaching and the things that are shared tonight, that Christ would have preeminence, that he would be glorified, that he would be exalted. For he must increase, therefore he will increase, and he is increasing even as we are being decreased. With more of him, there's less of us, and with less of us, there is more of him. So more of the Lord and less of everything else is our prayer. Lord, along those lines, I pray for every need to be met according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus, in whom we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ And I thank you that the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in Christ, and we are complete in him, for he is the head of all principality and power. He is the head of the body, the ecclesia, and the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we thank you and praise you, Lord, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I thank you for the power and witness of the testimony of Jesus in the earth, represented by the remnant of those who bear that testimony and proclaim the truth concerning Jesus. So Lord, whether it's a physical need, a financial need, an emotional need, a problem in our relationships or whatever the situation may be, Lord. I thank you that your grace is sufficient and your power is perfected and matured even in our weakness. So we embrace the cross and we trust and we pray, Lord, that with every death and burial, there is resurrection and new life. There is ruling and reigning on the other side of the cross. And so, Lord, we thank you for your divine wisdom. Impart your wisdom to us as we study your word, as we discuss the things that are near and dear to our heart concerning the return of Christ. Guide us and lead us, Holy Spirit, into all truth, away from tradition and deeper into truth, away from the religious philosophies and teachings of man and into the words of spirit and life that your your Holy Spirit teaches and reveals to us. And uh, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the precious brothers and sisters who are logged in from all over the world, joining together 
by the Spirit, to be taught by the Spirit. And so we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Wonderful. So if you are in agreement, say amen and type amen into your question box over there. That gives me a good little sound check. Wonderful. Well, we've got a full house tonight, no doubt about it. So if you are joining us after the top of the hour, welcome. We are in First Thessalonians chapter 4, and tonight we are discussing the return of Christ, the second return of Christ. Or I guess it would be properly called the second coming of Christ because he's already come once, so that would be the second coming, the return of Christ. And um, so I'm looking forward to it. I've got a lot of things to share with you, so I thought I would go ahead and do this right up front. I want to thank you, those of you who give and support to the School of Christ. Usually I say thank you at the end, and by that time people have either uh, – shut down for the night or they've gone to sleep or <laughs> or they just have to leave or whatever the case. Uh, and so you don't hear me say thank you for your support. But thank you for your support of the School of Christ that helps us to pay the bills and to make this webinar available on a regular basis free of charge to everyone all over the world. So uh, that's important. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a great tool, and we appreciate your prayers and your your support that helps to make it possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. First Thessalonians chapter four, as we have said in previous studies, Paul is writing his first letter. This is the beginning of his writing ministry, and his first letter is to the believers in Thessalonica. And so he is he has up until this point. Uh, just been giving them some encouragement, mentioning uh, how much he misses them and how much he wants to see him see them, but Satan has hindered them, he says. And um, so with some general words of edification, he leads up to the main point of his letter, which is to to give them some teaching and some correction and some guidance in the area of the second coming of Christ, or the return of Christ. So, <clears throat> excuse me, try not to get choked up too much in the teaching tonight. And incidentally, uh, if, if you have audio difficulties and you can't, it, you, things break up or you, you don't hear the teaching come through, don't panic because we record these teachings and we post them to the website. So if, if something happens, um, I just keep on teaching regardless, and usually the recording turns out okay. Um, but we don't guarantee the recording, so that's why the live experience is recommended just in case. So I hope you got your Bible uh, turned to First Thessalonians 4, and tonight we're going to divide it up into three sections just as a kind of a general category or a general outline. Number one, walk in holiness. Number two, work in quietness. And guess what number three is? Wait in joyfulness. Isn't that neat how that worked out? Sometimes you can get outlines to work out like that. Sometimes you can't. And, and in this case, it worked out pretty neat, I think. So walk in holiness, work in quietness, and wait in joyfulness. And we could call this the three attitudes of those who are waiting for the return of Christ. Uh, what what you should, what we should, can and should be doing while we while we are waiting for the return of Christ. So we're going to get into that in much greater detail tonight than in any of the previous uh, chapters up to this point. So let's begin. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, with walk in holiness. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. You know that you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification 
that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarn you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So, you know, what is the attitude of a believer who is following the Lord Jesus and is looking forward to his return? It's funny the different responses and attitudes that you see from people when they believe that time is short or that the Lord could return at any moment or that they don't have long to live. Uh, some people live it up and some people do some very strange things. They Maybe they buy a cabin out in the woods and they or up on top of a mountain and they go there to wait the end of the world. And I think as um, as we particularly in, in this, these last days, you'll see more and more uh, people responding uh, strangely to the idea of the end of the world and to the idea of the imminent return of Christ. Well, the return of Christ is certainly taught in Scripture, but Scripture also teaches us how we are to live in the meantime while we wait for the imminent return of Christ. So. What is the first attitude that Paul mentions? I think it's something that's very applicable to us today. And it is the exhortation, the reminder to walk in holiness. Well, let's break this down a little bit more. Number one, he says, abound more and more. He says, we urge, in verse one, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. So that is a call and a reminder to them that disciples of Jesus are expected to abound more and more. What does that mean? Well, it certainly doesn't mean to abound in material wealth and possessions. Uh, that, that might be a part of your life. It might not be, but it's not a condition for being a disciple of Jesus. Here, when he talks about abounding more and more, he is referring to spiritual growth and maturity. He is talking about bearing the fruit of the Spirit. So this is the abundant life. Jesus says that I have come to give them life, to show them life, that they would have life, and that they would have it more abundantly. So Paul says, now you have received the Lord Jesus you should abound more and more. And you should abound just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. So there's a lot of folks out there today that have been misled, and they think that so long as they pray the sinner's prayer, it really doesn't make any difference how they live. There's no great concern to grow spiritually. There's no really, in fact, they, they leave it up to, to the Lord. Well, if, if God wants me to grow, then he'll do the things that need to be done in my life, and I don't have to worry about it. And, um, you know, that's just like a farmer. Let's say I had a, a farm, and um, I had a cornfield out back, and I just said, well, you know, if God's called me, if he's really called me to be a farmer, then I just pray that he blesses my crops. And I'll just pray that the sun will shine and the and the rain will water the field. And if God wants me to have a harvest, then he can just give me a harvest. I just believe it and receive it. Meanwhile, I'm going to sit back and watch television. Well, what's going to happen? If he doesn't go out and sow and plant and water and fertilize and take care of the ground and do the things that need to be done to guard against the elements and guard against pests 
and other things that would come. He will not have a harvest. He will not be abounding. He will not be fruitful. And so there is such a thing in Scripture as sowing and reaping. Be not deceived, it says in Galatians. God is not mocked, is not mocked, but whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. So if you want to abound more and more in the Lord Jesus, if you want to produce spiritual fruit, guess what? You have to sow to the Spirit. You have to plant something. You can't just expect that God's. if God wants you to grow, you'll grow, and there's nothing you can really do about it. Well, there's plenty you can do to hinder your growth in grace. And if you can hinder yourself from spiritual maturity, then you can certainly help yourself to spiritual maturity. Paul says to the Corinthians, by this time you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need me to come and teach you again the very basic, elementary, fundamental principles concerning Christ. I gave you the milk. I couldn't give you the meat because you couldn't handle it. And by this time, he says, you, you ought to have grown past where you are. So we, we do bear some responsibility for our own spiritual growth and maturity. So at the School of Christ, one of the things that we concentrate on is discipleship and spiritual growth. We give you the tools. We give you the resources. We give you the, the path, the blueprint to follow. Uh, but we can't make you do the things that you need to do. Um, how do you sow to the Spirit? Well, one way is to meditate in the Word of God, to read the Scriptures, to study the Scriptures. This is one way you can sow to the Spirit. You can also plant good spiritual seed in your prayer life and in your worship of God. And uh, there's just certain things that you do. It's not just all about being. I think being is, is important, but uh, doing, putting into practice, is also important. So there's a responsibility that we have. First, while we're waiting for the Lord to walk in holiness, Paul says you must abound more and more. Never be content. Never be content that I've, I've come as far as I need to go. I've learned all that I need to learn. There should be an insatiable thirst for knowing the Lord and for pressing on toward the mark for the high call of God in Christ. I press on, I press on, I press on. Um, so the, I, I think that if you're focused on that and you're focused on spiritual growth and maturity in Christ, it must be Christ-centered. It can't be centered on church. It can't be centered on religion. It can't be growth and maturity so that uh, I can have a big ministry or people can see my spiritual gift or so I can be popular and respected. But we're talking about Christ-centered abounding in him, abounding in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So abound more and more in him. Secondly, Paul says, keep your body sanctified. Well, what does that mean? Well, it says to keep your body sanctified. That word sanctified means holy and set apart to God. Holy and and set apart to God. Now remember, he's writing the, the Thessalonians. They were Greeks. They were not Jews. And many of them worshipped idols. And many of those idols, uh, the, the worship of those idols and the religious ceremonies that surrounded those idols were rooted in sexual immorality. So Paul says, listen, now that you are followers of Christ, you need to learn how to keep your body sanctified. Your body, he told the Corinthians, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So now you don't go to the temple to worship pagan gods, and they would, you know, they would strip down and, and do all kinds of uh, sexual illicit things with one another in the worship of their pagan gods. And so Paul rightly teaches them that your body now is the temple. So you, you don't they, you don't go to a temple to worship the living God. You are the temple. And so that, that solved two questions. Where do I go to worship this invisible God? And how do I worship him um, as opposed to how I used to worship uh, these idols? So Paul says your body is the temple. So if my body is the temple, then I've got to keep my body sanctified and holy. So that solved the dual purpose of teaching them um, 
that they are the body of Christ. They are the ecclesia. That word sanctified is from the same Greek root word that is translated as saints. So the saints mean those who are sanctified, those who are holy and set apart to God. That's what a saint is. And scripture teaches that all believers in Christ, all, all disciples of Jesus, are saints. We are all called saints. Not called to be saints, but we are called saints. That means we are holy and set apart to God. Peter tells the believers, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a set apart people. So holy and set apart to God. Not just separated from the world. You can be religious and separated from the world and holier than thou and hypocritical and never really be set apart and sanctified to the Lord. So holy doesn't just mean standing separate from everything else. It means that I am consecrated to God. I, am, I have been set apart to God. And according to Scripture, this sanctification is the result of our union with Christ. So holiness is who he is in me, and when my behavior lines up with who I am in union with, then my behavior will be holy and my body will be sanctified. It's never the result of what I do. What I do is the result of who I am. Doing never leads to being. I can never earn my way into holiness. I can never deny myself enough times to achieve holiness and sanctification in myself. But holiness and sanctification is something that God does in Christ when he made us the righteousness of God in Christ. So it, it doesn't say that we earn our way into being in, into achieving the status of holiness, achieving sanctification, achieving sainthood, the way the harlot church will call out special church members who may have lived hundreds of years ago in some cases and go through this lengthy process of making them saints. <laughs> Well, once again, you nullify the word of God with your tradition from the scriptural standpoint and from the spiritual reality. God takes all of those who are in Christ and whatever holiness and sanctification and righteousness is in Christ becomes attributed to those who are dwelling and living and abiding in union with Christ. So it's, it's, it's just like, ladies, when you marry a man, most of the time you take that man's name. I know in the, in the modern world that's not always the case, and, you know, I don't want to go there. That's really beside the point. But the illustration helps us to understand that when we became one with Christ in our spiritual union, God identified us with Christ, and he, it says that he imputed his own righteousness to us, which means we are justified and sanctified and made holy and righteous, not because of anything we did or because of anything we will do, but simply because God put us in Christ. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, and that spirit is holy. Therefore, I am holy because I am one with Christ. So long as I walk in him, his holiness is my holiness. Now, I have the power to keep my body sanctified. I'm not trying to earn holiness through what I do or don't do, but because I am holy, living and dwelling in Christ, and Christ living and dwelling in me. Now I'm able to keep my body sanctified. Now I'm a vessel of honor, prepared 
for the master's use, and so are you. And so that's what Paul is teaching them, and that's why we abound in the Lord Jesus. So holiness is never about performance or earning your way into a place of right standing with God. You start out righteous with God. And spiritually speaking, that is your identity. Your mind must be renewed so that your mind can begin to think the way it's supposed to think. And once you get your spirit and your mind cooperating, then your body has to follow. Your body doesn't follow your spirit. Your body follows your mind. So if you renew your mind according to the spirit, and you don't follow the flesh, but you follow the spirit, then your body is going to obey your renewed mind. So that's why renewing your mind is important. But Paul starts with them with the most obvious area that needed to be considered in their situation. Keep yourself holy, not in passion or lust, like the Gentiles who don't know God. For God did not call us to uncleanness, it says in verse 7, but in holiness. So it's not a popular thing today, but there it is nevertheless. As we walk in holiness, we wait for the return of the Lord. So if you're still listening, if you're still there, type amen into your question box if you agree with everything you've heard so far. Wonderful. So you're still there. All right. Well, the third thing I would say, taking from the first section here, 1 Thessalonians, is that works matter. Some people think, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm saved. Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. So no matter what I do, I'm forgiven. So it doesn't matter what I do, and I'm not saved based on what I do. That's, that's the way a lot of, of people, that's their attitude. I think that's a wrong attitude. I think Scripture teaches that your works matter. We're not saying that you can earn your way into heaven. What we're saying is that when any man or any woman is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So it's impossible to receive the new life of Christ and still live like the devil. God has not called us to uncleanness but in holiness. Why? Well, he says because God has given us his Holy Spirit. Everyone say Holy Spirit. It's not the unholy spirit we've received. That's what we're trying to get rid of. It's the Holy Spirit. So if you've received the Holy Spirit, you've been made one with Christ. Now you have the power not to live the way you used to live. So your works matter. Because Jesus says it's by their fruit that you will know them. It's by the fruit. And let me give you a, a little interesting thing to think about. The, the fruit of the Spirit. You know those things are love and joy and, and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness faithfulness, self-control, I think I named them all. There's nine attributes of this spiritual fruit. But, you know, every one of those spiritual characteristics, they have actual outward manifestations. You can't just look at someone and see love. So how do you judge them by their fruit? You have to look at their deeds. How do you discern joy? You don't discern it. You see the evidence of it in somebody's life. Either they've got the joy or they don't. <laughs> Either they've got the peace or they don't. Either they've got the long suffering or they don't. But how do you know? Well, Jesus says, by their fruit you will know them. People who are full of the Holy Spirit act a certain way. People who love act a certain way. They speak a certain way. They carry themselves a certain way. You can tell this, Jesus says. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. <laughs> and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So you can fake it, but Jesus says that's how you know.
So there, there's certain behaviors that help us to see if someone's got the fruit or not. So your works matter. What you do matters. Not because it's going to save you or earn you a place in heaven, but your works demonstrate that you already belong to the Lord. So if your life isn't lining up with that, then it calls into question, do you really have a relationship with Jesus or not? So your works matter. God calls us to holiness. Let no one mistake. You know, every time I teach about grace and every time I teach about the, the love and forgiveness and grace of God and how he is merciful and long-suffering and how he desires that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of, truth, of the truth, whenever I teach on that or write on that, I always get dozens and dozens of emails from people. What about holiness? What about sanctification? You're giving people a license to go out and sin. No, I'm not. I'm just saying that God is full of grace. We need his forgiveness. We need his love. We need his compassion. We need to show a little bit of that to one another and to the rest of the world. But if you think by emphasizing the grace of God, you're giving people permission to go out and live however they want, um, then you're you're mistaken. And if you think I'm teaching that, then you haven't paid very close attention. You're, you've missed everything we've talked about the cross, taking up the cross, denying yourself and following after him. So works matter. It's important because God's called us to walk in holiness. I think that's probably clear to 95% of the people that are on this teaching, but uh, you never know. So we have to emphasize it. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't give you permission to go out and do whatever you want to do. So there's a, a maturity and a balance there. Well, the second section, while we're waiting for the Lord, first he says walk in holiness. Next he says work in quietness. Now this is interesting. Well, let's read this beginning in verse 9. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, here it is again, that you increase more and more. See, there is the idea again, twice now, of progression. Everyone say progression. Progression, progress, moving forward, growing. There's no such thing as just sitting still, coasting. If you're coasting and you're just sitting still, you're falling backwards. You're falling behind. Because it is an upward call, we press on towards the mark. Paul says that you should abound more and more. Now he says, now you already know to love one another, and you already do love one another. So what can, what can I tell you? I will tell you and urge you that you increase more and more. There's always room for growth and development and maturity. You contrast this with what Jesus said about the end times. He says, because sin will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So the greatest temptation, I think, and it's a temptation that affects not just those out in the world. It's not surprising that those out in the world would lose their love. But it's a very real temptation even for God's people as we become saturated by a society and by a religious system 
that is also steeped in the world and in the world's thinking, that the more self-centered you become, the less your love and concern for others grows. So love grows cold. Why? Because Paul says in the last days men will be lovers of their own selves. So this is the opposite of the crucified life. It's the opposite of the Christian who takes up the cross to follow after Jesus, who denies himself and finds joy and, and satisfaction and spiritual fulfillment by loving God and loving others. The way of the world is to put yourself first, and quite frankly, that's also the, the way of the harlot church, and it's the way of religion in general. It's to serve God for what I can get out of it. It's to help other people so long as they are helping me. And it's approaching the Bible, approaching prayer, approaching whatever it is you do, first and foremost with the consideration of how is this going to benefit me? How is this going to help me? Now, sure, you want to edify yourself, you want to grow, and you want to do all of these things. But the reason you want to do it, and the result of, of growing spiritually, is that you become less and less concerned with your own self and more and more concerned with the needs of other people. That's the single greatest distinction between the spiritually immature and the spiritually mature. And it, it follows and parallels the growth and development of your of your psychology, your 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 physiological from being a child to being a teenager to being an adult. Uh, babies and children, they are completely self centered. That's just the way they are. They have no concept of, of others except to meet my needs. When I cry, bring me a bottle. When I'm wet, change my diaper. And that's all they can do. They start out self-centered. That probably continues to grow through the, the teenage years. But eventually, in, in normal psychological development, by the time a person uh, is old enough to fall in love, they start putting other people first. They put their, their boyfriend or their girlfriend before their own selves. They start to get an inkling of what real love is all about when they're in that kind of a relationship. And then if they have children and that family is not dysfunctional, in a dysfunctional family, the parents care more about themselves than they care about the children. And that results in dysfunction and abuse and neglect. But in a normal family where the parents put the kids' welfare before their own welfare, you see an example of how the family, God, family of God is supposed to operate. So love puts the other person first. Well, as society in general becomes more and more self-centered and self-preserving, the temptation is every man for himself, look out for your own self, meet your own needs, do whatever you have to do to beat the other guy. So as Christians, we're called to represent a different truth, a different way, which is a way of serving God and serving others. Love God and love your neighbor. So Paul says, while the rest of the world is losing their love, and even while the religious system is becoming more hateful and spiteful, I urge you to increase more and more in your love towards one another. Verse 11, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life. Now this is really good for all of you Facebook fanatics to mind your own business. <laughs> to mind your own business. How much energy do we waste? How much time do we waste? Because we're so concerned in things that really don't have anything to do with us, but we insert ourselves into things that we shouldn't. And the Internet makes it easy. So that's a good tool, this Internet, but it can also be a, a huge distraction 
because it sucks you into things that really are none of your business. <laughs> you say, well, I just have to be informed. Well, I guess it's okay to be informed about some things, but then there's some other things that you're better off just to mind your own business. I mean, this is what Scripture is saying. Aspire to lead a quiet life. If you are poking your nose into everybody else's business, you have an opinion about everything, you have a comment about everything, then you can't lead a quiet life. There's always some conflict that surrounds you. <laughs> you either find it or you create it. <laughs> so aspire to lead a quiet life. My wife is a good example of someone who leads a quiet life <laughs> and minds her own business. She doesn't have a Facebook page. She's not interested in it. She doesn't have time for it. And in her way, she is minding her own business. <laughs> well, what would you do with that extra time and that extra energy that right now you're, you're wasting? Here's an idea something else we can do, aspire to lead a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Get a job. <laughs> you say, well, I'm looking for a job and, you know, there is, a, there is unemployment going on. Believe me, I understand. And I believe that that God is is going to meet your needs and meet my needs in a way that only he can do it. But the point is, some of the people there in Thessalonica got the idea, if Jesus is really returning any moment, then there's really no point in getting a job. There's no point in working. What for? Jesus might come back today. He might come back the day after tomorrow. So I'm just going to quit my job, sit around the house, and, you know, just do whatever, waiting for Jesus to return. You think, well, that's a silly attitude to have. Who would have that kind of an attitude? Believe me, lots of people, lots of groups of people in history have got into their mind that Jesus was coming back on October 15th or May the 3rd or whatever the date that the Bible teacher said. And so they sell everything and they go up on a mountaintop someplace and they just sit around in camp, in a camp, praying and singing songs and just waiting for Jesus to come back. And Paul says, no, that's not what, that's not how you are to live your life while you're waiting for the return of the Lord. Lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your own hands so you can pay your bills. And be responsible. So the, the right attitude is I'm either working a job or I'm looking for a job or I'm starting a business or I'm doing something useful. And it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. If you're retired, you say, I'm 80 years old. It's past the point for me. There's still things that you can do. You can be useful. So this is just some practical advice from Paul. Don't spiritualize the return of Jesus and think that uh, you can just use that as an excuse to be lazy. So Paul, Paul had a good work ethic. He wants us to be of the mindset of usefulness. Now, if you've worked all your life and you're retired, that's, that's different. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm speaking to the attitude of some who would say, if the world is ending in 2012, then what's the use? If Jesus is coming back, then what's the point? And there is a point. 
It, the point is to be faithful, to be a good servant, to be a good example, be responsible, pay your bills, take care of your family, do what you have to do. And people say, well, God's called me to the full-time ministry, and I'm going to quit my job, and I'm just going to stay home and pray and read the Bible. You better be very clear about the leading of the Lord when you start getting it into your head that you're supposed to quit your job and just go out on faith. And especially if there's family members at stake. Now, if you're single, you're 20-something years old, and you think that's what God's called you to do, uh, um, you know, go for it. You've got nobody to hurt but your own self. <laughs> but if you have a wife and kids, you've got responsibilities. And you need to take care of those responsibilities. Don't spiritualize all of that. And uh, try to try to take the easy way out. And somebody says, well, brother, you just don't have any faith. If God tells you to step out, you step out. Listen, I, I've, I've got enough faith, and I've stepped out more times than a dozen people put together. I've been there. I've done that. I've bought the T-shirt. And I'm telling you what Scripture says. It says we need to work with our own hands. We need to be an example. We need to be responsible. And I haven't found any situation where God tells you to not provide for the needs of your family and to not be responsible to pay your bills because he's, he wants you to sit home and read the Bible or pray or go out and preach. I don't think that's the leading of the Spirit. I think that's an idea you got in your head and you got it from religion. You got it from watching somebody else in the ministry. Uh, but, but you're mistaken. How do I know that? Because I've been there. I know all the arguments. I know all the excuses. I know all the rationalizations. I know all the scripture verses that you pull out to justify it. And I'm still telling you that this is what scripture says. You have an obligation to your family. You have an obligation to your wife if you're married, to your children. Again, if you're single, you've got more freedom. Do whatever you want to do. But I, I've heard too many examples, too many horror stories of people who had a dream or had a vision and they thought that God was calling them to quit their job and just go out and do something, and, and they don't even know what they're doing, but it, it just sounds appealing to them, and they think it's faith, and it's not. It's foolishness. That might happen one out of a thousand, and you're probably not the one. So that's all I'll say about that. Maybe that's for somebody specific. Well, work in quietness. Number one, he says, increase in love for one another, but... Even though you're concerned and you're in love with one another, be quiet and mind your own business. That's not the same thing as loving one another, poking your nose in everybody else's business. So mind your own business. Work and provide for your needs. Work and provide for your needs. Paul made tents. He was certainly entitled to support from others for his work in spreading the gospel, but he also made tents as an example. I work a full-time job, and I manage things and, and write and teach and do things here at the School of Christ, and, and Carla helps me out as well. You do what you have to do. Work and provide for your own needs. Don't get into a situation where you're relying on everybody else to send you offerings and, and donations. If that's the case, then you're just a pastor collecting an offering and a paycheck once a week. You don't want to be in that situation. Among other reasons, besides the fact that it's not a good example, everyone else has to go out and work, but you just sit back in your pastor study and, and 
all you do is preach. That's not being an example to everybody else. Now, I know that's against the, the religious system, but, you know, that's all right. I've been there and done that too. A better example, at least an example that I can respect, is a pastor who will work a regular job and will preach and do whatever he does on the weekends. Well, that's a step in the right direction, in my opinion. I just think you have to be practical. You have to be a good example. Work. Provide for your needs. Don't be in a position where you have to preach in order to get a paycheck. Because then you're going to cater to the people who are paying your bills. And you can't be a teacher and a spokesperson and a witness to the truth of God if you are relying upon the people you are preaching to to pay your bills. It's a conflict of interest. How is that not a conflict of interest? Well, one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to tell them what they want to hear so they'll keep giving, or you're going to speak the truth and they're going to get rid of you anyway and find somebody else who will tickle their ears. So either way, it's not a good fit. Get a skill, go back to school, get a degree, get a job, do something. But give up this idea of full-time ministry. Your ministry shouldn't be tied to your paycheck. I'm just I'm trying to warn you. There's, there, there's a day coming where that's not going to work. But a lot of people will not see it, and they will not get it until it's too late. So that's for them. That's not for you. The third section of this chapter... I've titled, Wait in Joyfulness. Well, he doesn't want them to be concerned. They were concerned about the coming of the Lord. They had some questions about it. So Paul is going to, to correct that. And in the next letter, 2 Thessalonians, he's going to go back and add even more correction to help them grasp this and, and thank the Lord that he did because it helps us to have something to base our teaching on as well, because we we have some of the same questions and concerns that they did. Verse 13, he says, I, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Now, that's a euphemism for those who have died. See, Christians didn't consider anyone to really die. They just fell asleep because they are alive to the Lord. So, Paul referred to it as falling asleep because we know that they're going to wake up again. They will live again. They will rise again. So he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now here's the key verse. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, it just doesn't get much plainer than that, does it? It's it's very plain, and he, he's writing to, to people who are concerned, people who have questions, so... Paul says, let me, let me go over this really carefully and be very clear so that there is no misunderstanding. So when we read it, um, we, we are struck by the vivid detail of how he describes the return of Christ. So let's get into, into that. So just some, some basic facts as we begin to build a case of understanding for the return of the Lord. Number one, Jesus will return. There's no question. There's no doubt. There's no debate. There's no argument. 
as to whether or not Jesus will return. He will return. Secondly, Paul says those believers who died will return with him. So the concern that the Thessalonians had is you know, we are believers in Jesus. We believe that he is returning. But what happens to those of us who die before Jesus returns? Are they going to miss this great event of his coming? Because they were taught that when Jesus returned, he would reward the righteous. He would deliver them uh, from evil. He would reward them, and they would, they would participate in his kingdom. And so their concern was, what if someone dies as a believer in Christ before Jesus returns? What happens to all the believers who died in the Lord before he returns? And so Paul says that's not a problem because what's going to happen is those who died in Christ, God will bring with him, with Christ, when Jesus returns. That's verse 14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So in verse 17, when it says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds. Them refers to the Lord Jesus and to those saints who had died in the Lord prior to his return. Won't that be an awesome reunion? What an awesome reunion. I just think that's the coolest thing. So those believers who died prior to the return of Christ, will return with Christ. And then Paul says, those believers who are alive and remain will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. (laughs) That's neat. That's exciting. It's very plain. It's very clear what Paul's talking about. So this is where we get into what religion has done with this very plain teaching. Just like it does all the other instances in Scripture where Jesus says, you nullify the word of God with your tradition. So there's a tradition, a religious tradition, that nullifies the word of God. And specifically... It nullifies what Scripture teaches concerning the second coming of Christ. And it's called the rapture of the church. Now, did you know that the word rapture is not found in Scripture? The word rapture. Now, you probably already know this, but the word rapture It's not found in Scripture. So what is the rapture that you keep hearing about if it's not found in Scripture? Well, it is an interpretation of Scripture. So there's a difference between what Scripture teaches... And then what we interpret scripture to mean. So you say, well, what's the difference? Isn't it the same thing? Absolutely not. The rapture teaching is different from the second coming that scripture teaches. Let's give you an overview and this hits in, you know, last week we, we released a four-part audio series called The Rapture, Fact or Fantasy. And the point of that teaching is not so much to debunk the rapture as it is just to teach plainly what the second coming is all about and what Scripture teaches. So I'm not really interested so much in trying to 
prove or disprove somebody's interpretation. I just want to lay out what Scripture says. And then once you look at it and study it, I think then it becomes obvious that what people have taken and interpreted is wrong. And it's wrong because I, I just have a rule of thumb. If the majority of people believe and teach a certain thing, and it's popular, then usually you can go in the opposite direction and you're pretty safe. If everybody in the whole world is preaching and teaching and believing a certain teaching, <laughs> and it's really popular, to me that's a sign to be suspicious and usually go in the opposite direction. Whichever way the crowd is going, go the opposite direction, and you'll usually come out pretty pretty well. Well, the issue of the, the rapture of the church is an instance where you take an interpretation of something, and if you approach Scripture with a predetermined conclusion that this is what I intend to find, this is what I believe, now let's find some verses that appear to support what I believe, you'll find them. But if you approach the Word of God as a Berean, if you approach it as someone who wants to rightly divide the Word, then you'll approach the Bible and you'll say, what does the Scripture teach? I don't care what Hal Lindsey teaches. I don't care what Tim LaHaye teaches. I don't care what John Hagee teaches. And I don't care what Chip Brogdon teaches. But I want to know what Scripture teaches, and then I can judge everyone else's interpretation based on that. So let's look at this rapture teaching and let's look at where it came from. Well, first of all, here's the rapture teaching in a nutshell. That there's a secret event that's going to happen called the rapture of the church. And this is when Jesus returns and all the Christians who believe in him are raptured. And what that means is that they, are, they suddenly disappear. They leave behind their clothes, their shoes, their cars, their boats, whatever it is they were driving or flying. They leave all of that behind. They vanish into thin air. And this is the fulfillment, supposedly, of 1 Thessalonians 4. And everyone that is left behind, all the sinners, all the non-believers, all the lost, they're wondering what happened. Where did all these millions of people go? And that's the rapture. Well, that, trigger, that triggers the seven-year tribulation called the Great Tribulation. And this is where God's judgments come upon the earth for seven years. This is where the Antichrist comes, the mark of the beast, and all of these terrible things. Finally, at the end of those seven years, Jesus returns with the saints, establishes his kingdom, judges the world, and that is the beginning of the kingdom age. Now, of the rapture teaching, there are three different possible schools of thought called pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation. Pre-tribulation, all of them assume that there is a seven-year tribulation called the Great Tribulation. Again, that's an assumption. That's an interpretation. There's nothing in Scripture that teaches seven literal years called the Great Tribulation. The Bible speaks of Great Tribulation. It speaks of persecution. It speaks of suffering judgment, all kinds of things, but the idea of seven years of tribulation is an interpretation based upon calculations in Daniel. Again, you have to discern the difference. Listen very carefully. Now, if this is the first time you've heard anybody contradict this popular teaching, 
then you may be you may be um, resistant to it. But but just hear me out and give me the opportunity to to get through this before you object to it too much. There's nothing in Scripture that teaches a seven year tribulation. Jesus teaches us that in this world you will have tribulation. It's been going on for 2,000 years. So yes, there are things in the book of Revelation that talk about God's judgment on the earth, but there is nothing in Scripture that says definitively that there is a seven-year tribulation. That's a conclusion, that's an assumption, that's an interpretation based upon some numbers in Daniel. It's not a teaching. It's an interpretation. Well, in the same sense, the rapture is not something that is taught in Scripture. It's an interpretation of Scripture. But all of these rapture interpretations rely upon a seven-year tribulation. Again, they cannot be substantiated conclusively from Scripture. But you have to accept that in order to accept the rapture. So if you accept, if you accept the seven-year tribulation period, then you fall into one of three categories concerning the rapture. Either Jesus comes before the tribulation to rapture the people, his people. That's called pre-tribulation. Or some people calculate it to mean that he is coming in the middle of the tribulation. That would be known as mid-trib. And then there are some who believe he comes at the end of the tribulation. And they are known as post-trib, post-tribulation. But again, all of this assumes that there is a literal, a literal seven-year tribulation. Well, who assumes that? Well, it, it's people who teach Bible prophecy, and they, they try to make that fit. They take some numbers and, and some calculations in Daniel, and they make it sound very persuasive. But if that falls apart, then the idea of the rapture falls apart, not the second coming. So what I'm trying to, to get you to see is that the second coming is scriptural. Jesus is returning, no question about it. But the idea of the rapture isn't scripturally supported. Where did this rapture teaching come from? This is going to be an, an interesting graphic once we, we pull it up, and I'll show it to you. But here's the flaw. Here's the primary flaw in this traditional rapture teaching. It's popular. It's what most people believe. It's what I was taught. But here's the flaw. Nowhere in Scripture does it teach that Jesus is coming back twice. It doesn't say he's coming back to take his people and then he's coming back to judge the world. But you have to believe that he's coming back twice in order to make all of these scriptures fit with the rapture interpretation. If you give up the idea that he has to come back twice, in other words, if you just approach scripture and you rightly divide scripture, you'll find that all of these passages of scripture, and I go through them in this audio teaching, it starts talking about it in the Old Testament. Through the prophets, they pointed to it. Jesus referred to it. The apostles referred to it. It's revealed again by John in the book of Revelation. It's all talking about the same thing. There is only one return of Christ. And when you try to divide these scriptures up and say, well, this is talking about the rapture, and this is talking about the second coming, and this is talking about before the tribulation, but this is talking about after the tribulation, then you really have to jump through a lot of hoops to make it all work. And it just, what I have found with scripture and with anything that the Holy Spirit reveals is the simplest explanation is usually the right explanation. It's when we approach it with a predetermined conclusion that we're going to make it say what we want it to say and what we want it what we want to believe, 
that's when we have to have all kinds of explanations and, and charts to keep it straight. And that's why the normal person can't read this and figure it out, trying to read it from the perspective that it is always taught by so-called Bible prophecy experts. But that's the biggest flaw. Where did this rapture teaching come from? Well, you'll be interested to know, I think, that it's not that old. This teaching about the rapture started in the 1800s by a British evangelist named John Darby, who was really the, the father of the modern-day rapture teaching. Prior to this time, there was no teaching that, that I know of, that I can trace, that taught that there would be two returns of Jesus, one for the church and one for judging the world. So it was Darby who popularized dispensationalism, which means that there are different ages and different seasons of God's dealings with man. And I do think some of that, there's something to be said for that. I do believe in different ages because Scripture teaches this age and in the age to come and in the ages to come. So I believe in the ages. But this is where this, this teaching started out. And in the, the same century, in the 1800s, there was a group of people who, based on this teaching, thought that they had calculated when Jesus was returning, and they did the things that, that we said. They, they gathered together on top of a mountain and waited until they thought Jesus was supposed to return, and then the, the minister said, no, I, I, made, I made a mistake, I calculated wrong, it's really happening six months from now or a year from now or whatever. So they went through the same thing again, and guess what? Jesus didn't return. Well, then some people said he, he came back, but it was a spiritual return. And you know people are still doing that today. Except now they get on the Internet, they get on the radio, and they say Jesus is coming back March the 5th or whatever. And then, oh, I, I made a mistake. I calculated wrong. It's really going to be October the 15th or whatever. And they've been doing this ever since the 1800s. This is nothing new. But it all is based on this teaching from John Darby. But that by itself, just an, a, a British evangelist, how does that become the most popular interpretation in the world? Well, it took a man named Cyrus Schofield, who wrote and published a very popular study Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. And this Bible is still being published today, and it's still very popular today. Why is it popular? Because Schofield put extensive notes in Daniel and in Revelation. Schofield was a student of Darby in the sense that he, he followed Darby's teachings and he agreed with it. And so Schofield put in the notes of his study Bible this teaching of the, pre, of, of the tribulation, a great tribulation based on calculations in Daniel, seven years. And the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And so as people bought that study Bible and they read those notes, this teaching became more and more popular through the 20th century. Now, if you were alive in the 70s or 80s, you remember a, a little blue book called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And this is when the teaching on the rapture went viral, as we would say today. The Late Great Planet Earth was published in the early 70s, first by Zondervan. It became the first 
Christian prophecy book to be published by the secular media. They recognized a good thing when they saw it. The secular media picked it up. Bantam Books published it in a trade paperback book, and today it has sold 35 million copies. Bear with me one second. I've got to get back to my slide here. Click the wrong button. That happens sometimes. Just when it's getting warmed up, right? Here we go. So we have Darby who came up with the teaching, Schofield, who wrote it into his Bible, and, and people who don't know any better, you know, they read a study Bible, they see the notes down there, and they, they take it for granted that, well, the guy must know what he's talking about. He published his Bible, put these Bible study notes in it. It must be so. <laughs> people believe what they see in print, so it must be so. Then Hal Lindsey comes along. He popularizes it. Sells 35 million copies. Worldwide. But that's nothing. Compared to Tim LaHaye. And Jerry Jenkins who published the Left Behind series of books. Now, I just want to remind you that this Left Behind series is 16 books now. And this is fiction. It's not. It doesn't claim to be Bible teaching. It's fiction. But they have managed to take and popularize the rapture teaching in a way that even Hal Lindsey has not been able to do. 65 million books sold worldwide. Three movies. They've got video games on Left Behind. They've got a whole series of books, left behind books, just for teens. And just kind of facetiously for the next bullet point, I put action figures. What's next? It's almost like a Star Wars saga. You've got the books, you've got the movies, you've got the video games, you've got a series for kids. What's next? Action figures. That's the only, only thing left you, that, that you could do, or write more books. I'm not criticizing them for their success. I'm just pointing out and trying to get people to understand why and how the rapture teaching became popularized. It didn't become popular because Christians all over the world, hungry and thirsty for truth, began to search the scriptures and pray and ask God to show them the truth concerning the second coming of Jesus. But this goes to show you what happens when you let other people do the studying, you let other people do the teaching, and one borrows from another and the other borrows from another and it just crescendos and it grows like a virus until now this is what people believe is going to happen. This is what most Christians believe. You say, well, Chip, what's the big deal? Well, let's compare it really quick. I don't have time to go through the whole teaching because the, the whole teaching is, it took me over four hours to record the teaching on the rapture, fact or fantasy. So if you want an in-depth study, uh, that would be the, the way to go. 
But just quickly, let's go through the difference. Because some people say, what, what is the difference? Well, let's go through it. Rapture. Number one, the rapture is an interpretation of truth. It's an interpretation of scripture. Scripture doesn't teach the rapture. The rapture teaching is something that Bible teachers have extrapolated from scripture. The second coming, however, is actual truth. It's not just an interpretation. Scripture actually teaches that Jesus is returning. But it's the spin and the tradition that gets attached to that truth that turns it into an interpretation. And Jesus says you nullify the word of God with your tradition. And the rapture is a tradition. I'm going to lose subscribers because of this. I'm going to lose people on this webinar because they'll be so offended that I would teach anything other than what the church has always taught. But, I mean, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be anything new. I mean, what, what did you expect? My question is, if the church has misled you about so many other things, why should you believe what they're telling you about the rapture? Well, that's just an interpretation. It's not the actual truth. Secondly, the rapture teaching has only been around since the middle 1800s. Nobody believed in it before then. Nobody taught it before then. It only became popular, and I showed you how it has grown in popularity. It's popular because that's what people want to believe. They want to believe that they can rule and reign with Jesus, but they don't have to suffer or go through anything or be tempted or tested or tried. They don't have to worry about the Antichrist. They don't have to worry about the possibility of going through tribulation. And so the motivation, the reason it's attractive to people is because it plays into their fear. It's very comforting to think Jesus is going to come and rescue me from whatever might happen down the road. But Christians have been going through tribulation and persecution for 2,000 years. Just because you and I haven't experienced it, what makes us think that we're so special that Jesus is going to return and just keep us from having to suffer for our faith? What makes us special and more loved? than any other Christian who's, who's ever suffered for their faith and who are suffering for their faith right now. So that rapture teaching has only been around for a couple of hundred years. It's only been, it actually been really incredibly, amazingly popular for the last 40 years. But the second coming of Christ, Scripture has been teaching for 6,000 years. Jude 14 refers to Enoch. And you'll remember that Enoch is the man in the book of Genesis who it says that he walked with God and he was not because God took him. <laughs> so in, in Jude 14, it references Enoch and it says, Now Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. See, that's exactly what Paul says. That Jesus is going to come, that those who died who, those who sleep in Jesus will return with them, then those who are alive and remain will be gathered together with them to meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, Enoch, seven generations from Adam, thousands and thousands of years ago, said, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Wow. That's, that's more exciting than anything a Bible prophecy teacher ever predicted. And there it is, thousands and thousands of years ago. And what's he going to do? To execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He's coming back to judge the world. It doesn't say anything about a secret rapture. People left behind wondering what's going on. It doesn't say that. Oh, we, we go through many scriptures that disprove that in the audio teaching. Well, the rapture says that Jesus will come before the tribulation. Well, that's comforting. I, I wouldn't mind being spared some tribulation and persecution and suffering. But I just don't expect it because Jesus said that in this world you will have tribulation. Paul says if you will live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. How much persecution have you suffered lately for living godly in Christ Jesus? Probably not much. 
unless you're living in certain parts of the world where Christians are persecuted. So it's interesting that this idea has been popularized by Americans who don't know a whole lot about persecution and suffering. And so they are very reticent and very reluctant and not very open to the idea that we might have to suffer something for our faith. We might have to go through some kind of a persecution. Well, the rapture solves that because it says Jesus is coming before the tribulation. Well, Scripture teaches Christ is coming after the tribulation. But it doesn't say the tribulation. It just says after tribulation. Again, you have to accept a literal seven years of tribulation. Scripture teaches that everybody in Christ who lives godly is going to suffer persecution. And Jesus says in the world you're going to have tribulation. But Jesus, if we just go with what he says, teaches us very plainly that it's after tribulation. Matthew 24, 29 says immediately after the tribulation of those days, mark that in your Bible, Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he doesn't say the great tribulation, he doesn't say at the end of seven years, he's just talking about things are going to get bad. I don't know how long it will be for. It might be seven years, but there's nothing in Scripture that makes that definitive. But the point being, Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now that is precisely what Paul is talking about in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Jesus appears on the clouds. There's a, a trumpet. He sends out his angels, and they gather the elect together. That's exactly what he's talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we just read. Now, rapture teachers will say, well, this isn't talking about the rapture. This is talking about when Jesus comes at the end of the, of the tribulation. That's how they justify it. But how can that be? when you consider 1 Thessalonians 4. It doesn't make sense unless you give up the idea that Jesus is coming back twice. He's coming back first to get his saints, and then seven years later he's coming back to judge the world. If you give that up, then Scripture fits perfectly. This fits in perfectly with what Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4. But the point is, after the tribulation of those days, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. Well, if this is happening after the tribulation, that means it's happened after the rapture. So how can he go and gather his elect with the angels? Who's to gather? They're all supposed to be returning with Jesus. See, it's little things like that, little details like that, that begin to poke holes in this rapture teaching. What makes more sense, and what is much more simpler, is just to accept the fact that whenever Scripture talks about the return of Jesus, it's talking about the coming, the second coming of the Lord, and there's that's just one event. It's not two events. It's one event. And it's the same event in Matthew 24 as it is in 1 Thessalonians 4, and elsewhere in many different Scriptures. Jude 14, it, it's, it's the same thing, the same event. Here's another interesting thing. The rapture teaches us that Jesus will return before the tribulation, which means he's returning before the Antichrist. So if you're saved, Jesus raptures you before the tribulation, which means you don't have to 
endure persecution. You don't have to go through the thing with the Antichrist. You don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. Isn't that comforting? That's comforting. It's also incentive that if you're not born again, you better get born again because Jesus might come tonight. So the religious system has used tribulation as effectively as they have used the punishment and threat and fear of hell to get people saved, or at least to get them to join the church. So the rapture teaches that Jesus will come before the Antichrist. Really? That would have to be, if he came before the tribulation, then it means that he would come before the Antichrist because the Antichrist shows up in the tribulation, right? Well, the second coming of Christ, as Scripture teaches it, says that Jesus is coming after the Antichrist, not before. So, where do you see that? Second Thessalonians. And I know we're going to teach that in, in a few weeks. We're going to be in Second Thessalonians, but just to, to make this point. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, talking about the same thing, the, ra the not the rapture, but the second coming, 1 Thessalonians 4, Matthew 24. Now, Paul writing a follow-up letter to the same group of people who just read his first letter talking about the return of Jesus. He says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. Here's a warning. Let no one deceive you, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What does he say? It's not going to come until Antichrist. Once Antichrist comes, after that, then the Lord will return. And it says in verse 8 that when the Lord returns, he will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, this is very clearly referring to the Antichrist that John is talking about in the book of Revelation. And Paul very plainly teaches, let no one deceive you by any means. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So when Jesus returns, he's going to destroy the Antichrist, the beast. But there's going to be an interim period there in the book of Revelation where there's going to be a spiritual warfare going on. And in other parts of Scripture, it says that, that he, the, the beast has power. Paul also talks about a falling away, of many people falling away from the faith. Well, it's just logical. So rapture teaches before Antichrist, which is exactly the opposite of what Second Thessalonians 2 teaches, that Jesus is coming after the Antichrist, that they will not come. Here's a big point of distinction, probably the most important thing of all, that the rapture teaching suggests that Jesus is returning for the Christians. Because to the religious mindset, there's only two groups of people in the world, the religious and the sinners, the saved and the lost the believers and the unbelievers. But according to Jesus, there's three groups of people. There's the saved, no doubt about that, the righteous. There's the lost, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. And then there's a third group. Does anybody know what that third group is?
third group is the religious hypocrites. And so while the the rapture teaches that everyone, all Christians, everyone who goes to church, everyone who believes in Jesus, is going up in this pre-tribulation rapture, Scripture teaches that Jesus isn't coming for the religious, and he's not even coming for all everyone who says, Lord, Lord. He is only coming for the faithful. He's not coming for everyone who, calls, who says to him, Lord, Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And what you should understand is that the kingdom of heaven begins or is established or you actually enter into the kingdom of heaven when Jesus returns. <laughs> so that's another way of saying, I'm only coming back for people that are faithful, people who watch and pray and are ready and prepared. Again, back to Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 45, or starting in verse 44, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But, if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of, verse 51, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the sinners. Is that what it says? He will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the lost? No. With the unbelievers? No. It says he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And you see throughout these parables of Jesus, you have wheat and tares. You have good sheep and bad sheep. You have good fish and bad fish. Religion teaches you that's the Christians and the rest of the world. But Jesus teaches that it's the righteous and the religious. In other words, the hypocrites. And they will be excluded from the kingdom at his coming. Notice that both of them are servants. One is faithful. One is good. One is profitable. The other is unfaithful, evil, unprofitable, self-centered, disobedient, and yet both of them are servants. Both of them serving Jesus, both of them saying, Lord, Lord, both of them collecting and, and enjoying the blessing of serving the master. But one servant is faithful and wise and serves, is obedient, does his master's will. The other one says, well, my master won't come back for a long time. So he just kind of does whatever he wants to do. Beats his fellow servants, eats and drinks with the drunkards, has a good old time. And so he's caught unprepared and unexpected when the master returns. And he gets sent outside of the kingdom. He gets put with the hypocrites. <laughs> and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All oh, those poor lost sinners, they're weeping and gnashing their teeth because they didn't accept Jesus. That's not what Scripture teaches. It says, appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. It's the hypocrites who are, who are excluded from the kingdom of God. And, and we go through all of these parables in the audio teaching. Four and a half hours. Then Jesus goes on to talk about the wise and the foolish virgins. They're all virgins. <laughs> but some are wise and some are foolish, and the foolish get left out. Another example. Wheat and tares. Tares are counterfeit wheat. They don't bear fruit. They look like wheat, but they don't bear any fruit. Well, that's all in the, in the teaching. 
I'm just giving you the big highlights tonight. So you can you can see that First Thessalonians four is referring to the second coming of Christ. The word rapture and the ideas behind the rapture is based on some Bible interpretation that's really gone bad. The rapture teaching says that when Jesus returns, he will judge the wicked. But according to what we've been reading and what I've been studying here in Scripture, the second coming of Christ is judgment on the hypocrites. It says that when the world sees him, they will weep and mourn. While the hypocrites will weep and gnash their teeth and be cast into outer darkness. It's going to be the biggest reversal you've ever seen. It's going to be shock and amazement, Jesus says, when you see all of these people that you thought were lost coming in from the north and the south and the east and the west to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God while you yourselves, the sons of the kingdom, you hypocrites, are cast out. I'm telling you, it's sobering. It's very sobering. What a deception. Millions and millions and millions of people deceived. Billions and billions and billions of dollars made on a false hope. Now the rapture, in my opinion, is a religious fantasy. But the second coming of Christ is a scriptural fact that we can rejoice in regardless of what tribulation we may have to go through. It's really irrelevant to the one who takes up the cross and follows after Jesus. The early believers were taught that you enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation. And I know that doesn't fit into the 21st century convenient model perspective of churchianity, but that's what scripture teaches. So here's how scripture teaches the second coming. I'll show you this graphic as we begin to close up. I've gone a little long tonight. Scripture talks about this age. The disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 24 and says, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That puts it right there. The coming of Jesus is at the end of the age. And you could call this age the age of the gospel. It's the age of the good news. Our stewardship in this age that we live in is to preach the word, to proclaim the good news concerning Christ, his lordship, his preeminence, that men ought to repent and believe the gospel. That's the good news. At the end of this age, it says that Christ will return. He will reward the righteous. He will cast out the hypocrite, weeping and gnashing of teeth as they go. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. But Lord, Lord, we cast out devils in your name. We prophesied in your name. In your name we did many mighty wonders. You taught in our streets. We went to church every Sunday. Jesus says, I don't know who you are. And he, he appoints them their portion with the hypocrites. Outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. But then we see in the, in the end of Revelation, if you, if you read all the way to the end, you see that Jesus establishes his kingdom, New Jerusalem. We're a part of that. We are the bride of Christ there in New Jerusalem. There's no temple because the Lord is the temple. We are his people. We're on the earth. And guess what? The gates are open. There's a river of life with trees of life, and the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. And then there's an invitation. Come to New Jerusalem, and the gates are open day and night. Come. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Come and be healed. Come and be restored. Come and be saved. It's the kingdom age. It's where God creates a new heaven and a new earth. It's exciting. There's some tough things we're going to have to go through between now and then. But that's why it's a, it's a hope. It's a blessed hope that we can rejoice in. 
and we can thank God for. The key to understanding all of this is just realize there's only one return. When Jesus returns, that's it. That's the end of the world as we know it, and it's beginning the beginning of a new world, a new heavens and a new earth. No sickness, no pain, no death. One return, proclaimed, prophesied, all throughout Scripture, from Enoch all the way to John the Apostle, and everywhere in between. It's a wonderful truth. Now, if this intrigues you, if it, if it angers you, <laughs> that's one thing, but if it intrigues you and you'd like to go deeper and go through all of those parables, then I want to invite you to go deeper with this four CD series, The Rapture Fact or Fantasy. It ties in very well with tonight's teaching, and I already shared with you, this is just a portion of that. Disc one, we talk about the truth about the rapture. Actually, I share some things on here tonight that's not even on the, the audio teaching. In disc two, we talk about what the Bible really says about the second coming of Christ what the prophets predicted, what Jesus taught, what the apostles taught, what the early Christians believed, so that you can get a good foundation. Disc 3, who gets left behind? That's where we go through the parables, and I talk about seven biblical proofs that show who really gets left behind when Jesus returns to take his people away. And in Disc 4, we talk about living in the end times, what you can ex expect in the world, what you can expect from the harlot church. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get more difficult. But we talk about how to prepare for the return of Christ, five discernment keys for living in the last days, lots of good stuff. If you want to go deeper. Many of you have already gotten this, and we've been shipping them out all week. You should be getting notification shortly, and you should be receiving it in the mail shortly. Um, so if you open your heart and open your mind, it will be a blessing to you, especially with the parables. If you just, if you, when we go through these parables and you see that Jesus gives you the answer, he gives you the answer key. It, it's like if you're going to take a final exam and the teacher gives you the answer key before the test comes and you have the answer key right there. And then the teacher begins to give you these tests. And you, you know exactly what the answer is because you already have the answer. Jesus gives us the keys to interpreting the parables before he gives us the parables. So I give you that key. I show you where it is. And then we go through the parables, and I show you how it fits into each parable. So there's no question when you're, when you're finished, you will understand how the religious tradition that we have taught for the last 200 years as part of, part of churchianity has nullified the word of God, but no more, because now we have the truth. And it's right there for those who have eyes to see. And if you can give up the popular teaching and not follow man, but just go with what the Bible says, you'll be relieved, you will be amazed at the greatness of God, you will be... Um, you will be just awed at how all of the pieces fit together, God's plan. So it's exciting. Three takeaways for you tonight. Or how, or how do you get this audio teaching? Go to the schoolofchrist.org slash catalog or click on the catalog link at the top. And it's the first item on the catalog page. You can click on the first item, the rapture, and go to a, a page that gives you a, a deeper description. The rapture fact or fantasy. I tell you, the, the scriptural fact of his return is much greater than the fantasy of the rapture. It's much greater. It, it's it's <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> Takeaway number one, God has called us to walk in holiness as we 
await the return of Christ. God did not call us to uncleanness, but he calls us to holiness. So we have a responsibility as well as a stewardship to the Lord and to the world. Takeaway number two, the return of Christ will be personal and unmistakable. That's another area where the rapture teaching falls short because it leads us to believe that suddenly millions of people disappear and nobody knows what happened to them. And someone has to come up with an explanation and everyone's all confused. The scripture says that when Jesus returns, it's going to be loud. He will descend from heaven with a shout. Who's shouting? The Lord. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. A trumpet is used to proclaim something public, loudly, to get everybody's attention. When Jesus returns, there's not going to be any mystery. It's not going to be quiet. It's not going to be secret. No one's going to be left behind wondering what happened. It says the whole world will see him. They will either weep and mourn or they will weep and wail and gnash their teeth because they were unexpectedly caught off guard. And even worse, they think he's returning for them, and he says, I don't know who you are. But it will be personal. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Acts one eleven says, this same Jesus that you have seen go up into heaven will in like manner come again from heaven. He's, he's coming back, folks. And it will be personal and unmistakable. That's why Jesus says, don't let anybody deceive you. If they say Jesus has come back and he's out here in the, in the desert or he's hiding up here on the mountain, don't believe him. Because when I come back, there will be no mistake. It will be like li a lightning flashing from east to west. You're going to know it and the whole world's going to know it. There's no secret floating away rapture. When I come back, it will be unmistakable. <laughs> I'm excited about that. <laughs> I am excited. That's the, that's the grand finale. That's the ultimate fulfillment of everything that the prophets have proclaimed and declared. So takeaway number three, the, the biggest thing to take away from this teaching tonight is that we've got to be able to discern between scriptural truth and human interpretation. So I, I've not even given you my interpretation of things tonight. I've just told you what Scripture says. And then when you take certain teachings and you try to make them fit into Scripture, it just it doesn't fit. You have to force it. And if you have to force it, then something's not right with the interpretation. The tail doesn't wag the dog. The dog wags the tail. So we don't take our interpretation and try to make Scripture justify it. Our tradition, our teaching, our opinion, our belief must be submitted to the truth of Scripture.